Today's Gospel reading is from the first chapter of the Gospel according to St Mark, beginning at verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the Gospel news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them. and They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This year, almost all our Gospel readings on Sunday, apart from Lent, will come from the Gospel according to St Mark. And so today, instead of unpacking the reading, I want to talk briefly about some of the main characteristics of Mark's account of the Gospel that you'll see over and over again as the year progresses. We're tempted to think of the story of Jesus' life, teaching, death and resurrection as a seamless whole. But really, that whole is made up of four different versions of the gospel story. And each has very distinct emphases and quite different flavours. During this year of Mark, I hope that you'll see some of these distinctive characteristics over and over again, and that you come to see the way in which Mark uses them to make his point. Today's gospel reading comes from verse 14 of the first chapter of the gospel according to Mark. In the previous 13 little verses, Mark has introduced us to John the Baptist, told the story of the baptism of Jesus. There's no explanation about how Mary got pregnant or the details or no details at all about Joseph, the first Christmas, the shepherds, the wise men, angelic choruses or guiding star. We're simply told that after his baptism, Jesus had a time of temptation in the wilderness. Luke's account of the gospel takes three full chapters to get to the temptation in the wilderness. And he spends 12 verses looking at the temptations, as opposed to Mark's mere two verses. So the first characteristic I want to emphasise is that Mark's account is short and to the point. There's not a lot of interesting but unnecessary detail in Mark. It's by far the shortest gospel. It's barely 16 chapters. John has 21, Luke has 24, and Matthew has 28 chapters. This doesn't mean that, the, that Mark's gospel story is unsophisticated though. It's as carefully wrought as the other three, but it is short. The gospel according to Mark has a sense of urgency. Everything moves quickly in the narrative. The words and then or immediately or straight away appear over and over again in this gospel. Even in today's account of the call of Simon and Andrew and James and John, there's no hesitation. Jesus calls and immediately they leave their nets to follow him. This urgent response to the call of Jesus is balanced throughout Mark's version of the gospel by the inability of the disciples to actually work out the meaning of the very events they're caught up in. In particular, this recurring motif of the failure of the disciples is focused on Peter. It's interesting to speculate on the reason for this strong motif throughout Mark's version of the Gospel. Tradition, but not historical evidence, says that Mark is the amanuensis or the secretary for Peter, that the account given to us by Mark is actually Peter's version of the events. Certainly, Peter's failure is very clear in this gospel. But it also may be the case that this gospel was written partly to encourage those whose faith had been tested and who needed to recommit to their new faith. If Peter was sometimes a failure as a disciple, maybe it's okay for all of us to fail from time to time. Mark's account of the gospel with its uncluttered narrative, its urgency, it's reassurance that failure in discipleship does not mean the end, 
also has a peculiar and powerful literary device, which is sometimes cheekily called a Markan sandwich. This is where Mark's narrative begins a story and then interrupts with a different story before returning to the conclusion of the opening story. A good example appears in a few weeks' time when we read chapter 5. At verse 21, Mark begins the story of the raising of Jairus' daughter. Jairus is a leader in his synagogue but has heard of Jesus' miraculous powers and so comes to him begging for assistance from this rabbi for his sick daughter. As Jesus begins to travel to Jairus' house, the narrative changes focus to a sick woman in the crowd who has unrestrained menstrual bleeding for 12 years. The woman, who is therefore ritually unclean and pollute anyone she touches, nevertheless reaches out to touch Jesus' cloak and she is healed in spite of her unworthiness. Jesus says to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Then immediately the focus returns to the story of Jairus' daughter. In the time taken to go to Jesus, the child has died, but Jesus, ritually unclean by his encounter with the woman with the hemorrhage, then touches the daughter and brings her to restored life. The sandwich then is made up of the start of Jairus' story, the story of the unclean woman, and then back to Jairus and his daughter. The juxtaposition of these two stories, which mutually inform each other, helps us to understand what's going on. This is by no means an unsophisticated story, no matter how sparse it might be. The Mark and Sandwich is found all through the Gospel. Listen for it this year. Occasionally the same literary device is used in the other Gospels too, but it's clearest in Mark. Finally, Mark's version of the Gospel story ends rather abruptly. Most biblical scholars agree that Mark's account of the resurrection ends suddenly at verse 8 of chapter 16, when the women come to the tomb early in the morning of the first day of the week. When they find that Jesus' body is not in the tomb, they fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Here there are no angels, nor the apostles for reassurance, nor the risen Lord calling Mary Magdalene to new faith. There is just fear and uncertainty. I've always found this account of the first experience of the resurrection as profoundly true. I'm sure that my reaction would have been like that of the women. And yet we know the story does go on. There is a conventional end to the gospel according to Mark, and we know that others experienced the risen Lord in person and so came to resurrection faith. So to recap, this year's gospel readings from the gospel according to Mark have a very distinct flavour. This gospel is short, relatively uncluttered, has a sense of urgency, a strong motif of discipleship failure. Mark and sandwiches as a device to help us make sense of the stories and a truncated but very believable account of the first Easter morning. Watch out for these characteristics as the year's readings progress. This is a great gospel. I always encourage people who don't know the stories of Jesus to read Mark first. It really is a gospel for busy, slightly wavering people who long to understand more and be caught up in the urgency of God's plan of forgiveness, hope, and love. God bless you this week in all you do.